Good morning and welcome to church. And for those that are joining us on Facebook this morning, we are so thrilled that you have chose to join with us as well. Our scripture this morning comes from John's account of the gospel, chapter 3. And we'll be reading with verse 17 and 18 this morning. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, as I come before you today, we acknowledge that we are utterly dependent upon you. Lord, I know I cannot teach this word in the flesh. I ask for the anointing power of your Holy Spirit. I ask for your cleansing, Lord, that you make me a vessel that is fit for your use. Just wash me thoroughly in the blood of Jesus. Lord, I pray for each one that is listening. I ask that your Holy Spirit will speak to each and every one of our hearts. We're all in a different place in our journey with you. Lord, I know I could not possibly speak to each person with where they are, but I know that somehow your Holy Spirit can miraculously take these words and let us hear what it is that we need to hear from you today. And so, Lord, we simply ask that you will speak to us. Draw us closer to you. Reveal to us what it is that we need to hear from you today. And it's in that precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Being lost is a terrifying experience. Vicki and I have watched a documentary series on television that's uh, titled, I Shouldn't Be Alive. Have any of you seen that? And the title says it all. It's about people who have found themselves in extreme life-threatening situations and miraculously survived. And when they tell their story, it's, I shouldn't be alive. And some of those stories are about hikers. And I think those are the ones that really get our attention since Vicki and I enjoy hiking so much. It hasn't been too long, we watched one of the episodes, and it was about a young couple in California that had been at a conference. They went out on a date, and they went up on top of one of the mountains on a tram, and there were some trails there. And so they went out for a walk on the trails, and they thought they heard a waterfall. They left the trail to go find it, and of course, in the mountains, echoes make things seem a little different than what they are, and so it took them a while to find the waterfall. But when they found it and got ready to return, they realized they didn't know where they were. They thought they headed in the right direction. And they never found the tram. They never found the trail that they had been on. They ended up spending the night. And then they decided that the thing to do was to go back down the mountain to where the water was and follow the water. Perhaps you've even heard that, follow the rivers. And they go back down and they spend another night out there. Temperatures in the evening are getting down near freezing with it. They weren't prepared for that. The next day they head out and then the, during the day they saw a blue tent out in front of them. And they were thrilled. They go running and screaming thinking they have found someone. And when they arrive at the tent, everything is still there at the tent except an individual. And then they began noticing that things have been here quite a while. They found the backpacker, uh, backpack. They began going through and it had maps, accurate maps. And he had written in the margin of the map, no way out. And then he had written his last words, and if anyone ever found it, to contact his family. You see... When you get lost and you realize that you are lost, panic 
sets in. Your head begins to spin. You feel desperate and confused. Fear clutches you. And then after a little bit of time, you begin to lose hope. I'll never find my way out of this mess. And it seems like every year you start hearing the stories of hikers who got lost. Some are rescued and others tragically perish. And the strange thing about being lost is that you can be lost and you don't even know it. In fact, most people are lost long before they ever come to the realization that they're lost. And it's during that time that you can get good and lost. They're just going along on their merry little way and suddenly it hits them. I don't know where I am. And even worse, I don't know how to get where I need to be. And sincerity is no guarantee that they're on the right path. In fact, most hikers that wound up lost thought they were on the right path. They thought they were on the trail until it was too late. And you don't have to be alone to be lost. Oh, many people have been alone, got lost. A couple I shared with you was a couple. In fact, I read about a group of 24 about a year and a half or two years ago that got lost on Mount Ord in Arizona. So even a large group of people can get lost. And as strange as it may seem, when some people realize that they're lost, they begin running. Now, that's not going to help anything. If anything, it's probably going to make matters even worse. And when we're lost, we can't trust our feelings. In fact, that's probably what got us lost to begin with. So when we're lost, we need help. We need someone or something outside of ourselves to rescue us or to show us the way. A map or a person who knows the way. And without reliable, accurate assistance, we will perish. Lost. It's one of the terms that Jesus used to describe our spiritual condition when we do not have a personal relationship with God. In fact, Jesus told three stories. You probably have heard these. He told the story about the lost sheep. The shepherd has a hundred sheep. One of them gets lost. And the shepherd leaves the ninety and nine to go and search for that one lost sheep. And Jesus was saying that we're the one that was lost. And he's the good shepherd. And he went looking for us. He told another story about a woman who had ten coins. It's all she has in life and she lost one of them. And so she cleans everything out looking for that one lost coin. And he says that was the rescue mission that he came on. He wants us so much that he was willing to come to this earth to seek us out. And then he told the story about a lost son. And all of these are describing what it's like when we don't have a personal relationship with God. We're lost. And so we go hurling towards our eternal destiny, unaware many times even of the fact that we are lost. It doesn't mean that we're immoral or lawless. It doesn't mean that we're bad neighbors. It doesn't mean we're irresponsible. It doesn't mean we're not even friendly. We're just lost. 
We may be sincere, but we're sincerely lost. We're unconsciously going through life out of touch with the very one who created us. And in the book of Proverbs, it describes our condition saying, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. Oh, it seems like we're doing the right things. We like to be right. We talked about this a few weeks ago. We want to be righteous. We want to think that the things that we're doing are right. And so we're doing what we think are the right things, but it still leads to a dead end. We're still lost, still disconnected from the God who created us. Very much like the story of the lady be good. The Lady Be Good was a World War II bomber. They were returning from one of their missions over Italy, and they had calculated how long the return flight should be. But the crew was unaware of a strong tailwind, and it was pushing them faster and further than they ever expected. And as the gauges indicated that they were approaching their base, they refused to believe their accurate gauges. They were confident that they were still flying over the Mediterranean Sea, and so they kept going. And eventually they exhausted their fuel supply, and they were going to have to bail out. And so they're preparing for a sea rescue, and then they jump and they land in a sea of sand 440 miles beyond their destination. All but one crew member survived the jump, but all the rest of the crew would perish in that desert. And it would be 15 years before the plane or the crew would ever be found. And then it was totally by accident. Why? Because there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. They followed their feelings, and the tragedy is that story is being repeated daily. They're good, sincere, well-meaning, intelligent people traveling on a collision course with death, unaware of their eternal destiny. And that's really why we're here. That's really the reason why the church exists. Because it was Jesus who said, For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. Nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to planet Earth on a rescue mission. A mission to seek and save lost humanity. A mission for you. To seek you out. To rescue you. And to save you from perishing. See, think about the Bible as that absolutely reliable instrument panel. And it's just like the crew of the Lady Be Good. If we fail to trust that absolutely reliable instrument, we will perish. That's why Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. See, it doesn't matter how sincere you may be. If you fail to believe that basic message of the Bible, you will perish. John stated it this way, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, 
He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. It is really that simple. If you have a personal relationship with Jesus, then you have eternal life. You've been rescued. And if you've never experienced that personal relationship with Jesus, you're still lost. And unless you come to him, you will perish. And that's why the message of Jesus is called the gospel, the good news. Because the good news is that God is offering to rescue us. It's a gift. It's the gift of salvation. It's the gift of the forgiveness of our sins. It's the gift of eternal life. And it is all directly connected to his son. Now, let's be really clear about this. It has nothing. I mean absolutely nothing. Read my lips, nothing to do with religion. Many religious people will perish. Religion doesn't rescue anyone. It's really about a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. God doesn't have some long list of do's and don'ts and then at the end of the journey check off what you did and didn't do to enter into his kingdom. You don't have to get your life straightened out. That may be one of the biggest lies that's ever come out of the pit of hell. That somehow if you want to come to Jesus you got to get your life straightened out. Let's get this straightened out. The reason Jesus came to this earth on a rescue mission was because you couldn't get your life straightened out. And that applies to all of us. And so it's not getting everything straightened out so that we can come to Jesus. See, God is coming to rescue us because we're lost. And He's offering us that free gift of eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ. And Paul tells us precisely what we need to do in one verse. It's that simple. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's that simple. What do I have to believe? Well, basically it's that Jesus says is who he says he is. That he came to this earth on a rescue mission. That he came seeking you out. It's what we've been remembering this week. That he came here and he gave his life as a ransom. Jesus paid your sin debt. And the only one who could ever pay your sin debt was Jesus. That's why he says, I am the way. There is no other way. He's the only one that could ever do that. And the proof that the message is true is found in the fact that we are celebrating his resurrection today. And so it's believing that Jesus is that rescuer, the one who came to redeem us, the one who came to pay our sin debt. And believing that it's true because God raised him from the dead. And then it's confessing that Jesus is Lord. Now, that means you have to believe it before you confess it. And what does that mean, that he's Lord? This isn't something about giving God lip service. It means that I really believe that Jesus is the one who has the right to govern over my life. The one that I am going to follow. And so I make a confession that he is going to be the leader in my life. The Lord over my life. And he says, when we believe that and we make that confession, we have been rescued. You see, just because it's free doesn't mean that it's not valuable. It's more valuable than any of us could ever afford. If you had to pay to be rescued, you never have enough money. Even Jeff Bezos couldn't afford it. 
It's something that we can only receive as a free gift. And because it's free doesn't mean that it's cheap. Jesus paid a big price to rescue you and me. It cost him everything. Think about this. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Now, every one of us has sinned. The Bible says that too. We've all sinned. We may not like that, but it doesn't change the reality that we've all sinned. And it doesn't change the reality that the wages of sin is death. And so someone has to pay the debt. And it's either going to be Jesus who takes the hit on the cross, or you're going to have to pay the debt yourself. And the Bible says that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. When Jesus died on that cross, he literally took my sin and your sin upon himself. In fact, that's why the Bible says that Jesus cried out from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, it was at that moment that Jesus became the sin of the world. And because God is holy, he cannot have sin in his presence. And so that perfect communion and fellowship between the Father and the Son was broken when Jesus took the hit for your sin and mine. See, that's what sin does. It separates us from God. That's why we're lost without Jesus. Our sins separated us from God because God is holy and he is pure and he cannot allow sin in his presence. Isaiah the prophet stated it this way, your iniquities have separated you from God. See, our sin separates us from God because he's holy and we're not. And because God is just, he can't simply overlook our sin. Justice demands that our sin be atoned for, that the payment for our sin has to be paid. Someone has to pay the price. And it's either going to be Jesus or you. Back to John chapter 3. We didn't read verse 16 this morning. Most of us may even know that. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You see, that's God's solution to our dilemma. Jesus loves us so much that he gave his life on the cross, taking our sin debt, paying it, being separated from the Father, all because he loved us. Jesus told that other story, the lost son. It's about a teenager. And he decided that life on the farm was a little too laid back. It was more than that country boy could hack. He didn't like going to bed early. He didn't like getting up early. And so he asked his father for his inheritance early. And eventually his father gives him his inheritance. And so with his pockets full of money, he heads out to the big city to have a big time. And what he found in the big city was a big time. But he also found the hangovers and the fair weather friends. He found his pockets eventually emptied out. And then he found himself in the unemployment line. And when he reached that pig pen of life, he decided it was time to go home. He reasoned within his own mind that even my father's hired hands have it off better than I do. I'm going to go home and 
He practiced this little speech for his dad. I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But will you just take me on as one of your hired hands? It probably went over and over that in his mind. He wanted to get it right when he saw his father. And then when he comes in sight and his father looks out from the house and he sees his son, he bolts out the door, off of the porch, down the path. He runs up to his son with his arms wide open and throws him around his son and welcomes him home. He never got to use his little speech. All he experienced was the open arms of his father. Now, his brother, who hadn't went off and spent all the money, got a little upset when the father threw a party. And the father stated it this way, this son of mine who was lost is now found. He was as good as dead, and now he's home. You see, the message was clear. The same arms that welcomed him are the same arms that welcomed me. It's the same arms that welcomes you. There's no wagging fingers, no clenched fists, no I told you so, no interrogation. It's just the sweet open arms of Jesus. And by the way, never were those arms ever opened as wide as they were on a Roman cross. Because he loves us. See, the only real question is, what do I do about it? Do I accept the free gift that God has offered to me? And if you've never accepted that free gift, I want to ask you just to listen to me. This is important. Because if you've never made that decision, your eternity is at stake. See, everyone has eternal life. The question is, where will you spend it? Will you spend it in the sweet arms of Jesus? Or will you spend it separated from God? See, God sent his son so that we might spend eternity with him. Listen to these verses again. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's why Jesus came. This isn't about condemnation. This is about being rescued. This is about being saved. I was lost. And now I can be found. But unless we misunderstand, John goes on and says... Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. See, what that means is before we come to Jesus, we are condemned. Why? Because we sinned. We violated God's commands. The wages of sin or death. We already stand condemned. And when we leave this world, we'll pay for that condemnation unless we allow Jesus to take that hit for us. And unless we come to Him and believe in Him. You see, without Jesus, there is no hope. The Bible's clear when it says, There is no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved. It's the only way. This is God's plan of rescue. There is no plan B. This is it. It works and it's offered to us freely. You see, the reason we're here today is because Jesus came to this earth on a rescue mission. He came to rescue you. And the single most important decision that you will ever make in your life is what you're going to do with Jesus. Reminds me that 
just prior to the Passion Week, Jesus went to the tomb of a dear friend, Lazarus. And there he saw Lazarus' sister, and he says, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me will never die. And then he asked her a question, do you believe this? You see, that's the important question. Do you believe that Jesus came here on a rescue mission for you because he loves you so much that he wants you to spend eternity with him? And he wants you to be in a personal relationship with him right now. That's the decision that we're faced with in our life. What do I do with Jesus? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much that you came here to seek and to save that which was lost. Lord, I thank you that you saved me. Lord, I pray for anyone that's hearing this right now that if they do not know Jesus, that they'll come to believe in him and confess him as Lord before the day is done. Lord, let us understand how lost we are and that you are our only hope. And it's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. We'll share in communion together. Give me just one second here. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he met with his disciples in the upper room. He had had a tremendous desire to share that particular Passover with his disciples. And that evening, Jesus did something entirely different. Oh, there was an order to the service. It was called a Seder. But Jesus went off script that evening. And when Jesus took the bread, there was nothing unusual about that. But it was what he said. This bread is my body. And then he blessed it. Oh Lord, we thank you for the bread that came down out of heaven. Not as our fathers ate and died, but that whoever eats this bread lives forever. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, the bread of life. And it's in his precious name we praise you. Amen. And then he broke the bread. After that, he took the cup. Once again, nothing unusual about that. There were four cups that evening. It was probably the cup of redemption. But once again, Jesus went off script. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And he blessed it. O oh Lord, we thank you for the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know in your word that it says, without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. And yet it says that it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sins. We thank you for the one that John identified as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We thank you for Jesus Christ who poured out his blood for the forgiveness of our sins.
And then Jesus invited his disciples to partake. Hopefully you received your communion when you came in. If you do not have the little cup, would you just lift your hand up? We'll get you one. We all have one. Great. All right, at this time, if you'll pull the cellophane off of the top, not the foil, but the cellophane, you will find the wafer. And for those that are joining us at home with whatever you have right now, the body of Christ broken for you. And now if you would remove the foil, you probably want to do that carefully. The blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for the gift that you have given to us. That you gave your body on the cross, that you poured out your blood. And that through the power of God, you were raised again into newness of life. And that through your death and your victory, that we have been given victory as well. It's in that precious name of Jesus we praise you. Amen. And I invite you to stand.